Hello everyone, my name is Frans Rodenberg. I'm the other lecturer of this course, and today we're going to be talking about model selection. Most of what I'm going to be talking about today is also covered in the book, Elements of Biostatistics, uh, sections 2.6.2, all the way to the end of paragraph 2.7. Now, model selection is a complicated topic because it involves a series of uh, considerations that you have to make, which tie in both to your statistical knowledge and also to the biological knowledge of your research subject. So um, you cannot make these decisions just by understanding statistics, nor just by understanding biology very well, which is why it's important that you are aware of all the phenomena that can occur during model selection. Uh, another thing I want to say is that, um, yeah, this is a very important subject that you have to think about before you start collecting data. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is admitted variable bias and confounding, and this isn't something that you can fix after you collect your data, unless you recorded the variables that might be omitted or confounding the results. So what you have to record, what you have to observe, and what you have to include in your study is something uh, that is going to profoundly affect the model selection process, and it's also going to affect the validity of your conclusions. So you have to think about these things before you start experimenting. So this isn't particularly relevant for this course, but I just wanted to uh, yeah, mention this because you're all going to be doing internships. And some of you are maybe going to do PhDs or research for a company. And it is very important uh, that you don't yeah, waste your research by doing experiments and then coming to the conclusion that you can't even draw the conclusion that you're interested in with the data that you've collected. So the topics I'm going to be talking about today is, well, first of what model selection is, and then some reasons why you would want to include more variables, uh, then some reasons why you wouldn't. Uh, and finally, I'm going to be talking about how you can find the balance between uh, the number of variables and also why this balance is very important. So with that out of the way, uh, let's get started. Model selection is very simply uh, deciding between a set of candidate models. So uh, another way to think of it is which variables should you include in your model. So suppose we have some biological process like uh, development of cancer, and there are certain things that we know or we think we know uh, will affect the chance of cancer development. Like if you smoke, there's a higher chance of developing cancer. If you have a familial history of cancer, then you have a higher um, instance rate of cancer. But, you know, these things do not guarantee that any particular person gets cancer because there is also a stochastic part to this process, namely random mutations that you accumulate over the course of your life. And, you know, these can be caused by a myriad of environmental effects that uh, are either truly random or, you know, we can't measure them. Like uh, think of background radiation and uh, which parts of the skin are affected by sunlight and which... Uh, uh, timeline uh, amino acids are adjoined and, you know, uh, failure of DNA repair mechanism. So there is no way that you can get a deterministic model to predict a biological process. So what we're doing instead and why we're doing statistic, statistics is because we want to find a model that can as closely as possible resemble the true biological process. And we do that by extracting the systematic part. So in terms of regression analysis, which is what we've been focusing on mostly for the past uh, week and a half, we want to find uh, a model uh, Y that's response variable. So that would be the biological process here, whether someone develops cancer or not, is defined by some systematic parts. So an intercept and a series of slopes for, uh, yeah, for example, smoking behavior and um, known genetic markers and I don't know, uh, familial history stuff like that uh, and then after accounting for all those things there's still a random deviation because we don't know for certain who will develop cancer and who won't now if you do this very well if you have a very good model then you include the axis here the explanatory variables such that uh, the systemic part of the model captures the systemic part of the true process as closely as possible uh, and the difference is, of course, this concerns a population, whereas we only have a limited uh, sample 
from which we can draw the conclusions about the population. So it's difficult, but uh, we have to somehow use our sample to obtain uh, a systemic part that closely resembles the truth. Let me give you a short example. Um, so suppose that you're interested in the effect of uh, weight on blood pressure and you measure systolic blood pressure and you measure weight in kilograms. Uh, and then a very simple model, so that's called M1, model one, could be uh, the blood pressure is some base level uh, plus some slope times your weight in kilograms. And of course, uh, there's a random deviation that's epsilon. Um, but yeah, you know, you could include other variables. Maybe you think that uh, taller individuals have a different blood pressure. Probably not, but uh, who knows? So then you can include another variable. So you have an effect of weight and you have an effect of height. Uh, but you could argue that uh, people who are taller are on average heavier. So the uh, difference in uh, blood pressure is probably uh, going to be uh, related to the combination of weight and height. So uh, in that case, you could include uh, an interaction. So here we have, again, uh, some base level plus an effect of weight, an effect of height, and an effect of the combination of the two. Uh, and at the end, of course, the random deviation. But uh, yeah, as you probably know, uh, there's also other ways to consider this combination instead of an interaction. Uh, for example, BMI, which is also uh, an indicator of a combination of your weight and height. So yeah, why not try this instead? You have the weight, the height, and you can calculate the BMI, and then you use these three effects. Uh, now this is only with uh, weight and height as a consideration, uh, and already uh, I've come up with four models that you could decide between. And you know you can easily come up with uh, better examples um, like uh, HDL cholesterol or LDL cholesterol um, that are probably more closely related to blood pressure. Um, and that means that it's uh, very easy to come up with a very large number of uh, candidate models uh, from which you might want to choose. So the question is then, which model should you use? Should you use M1, M2, M3, M4, or yet another model with a different combination of variables? So in other um, words, which variables should you include in your model? Now that's going to be the subject of today's, today's lecture. Uh, and first I'm going to be talking about some reasons why uh, you have to include certain variables. Uh, then I'm going to be talking about some reasons why you shouldn't include some variables. Uh, and finally, I'm going to discuss some methods for choosing between candidate models after you've already made the other considerations. So the first uh, reason that we're going to be discuss is called the principle of marginality. And this is a reason why you should include certain variables. Now, the principle of marginality has to do with interactions. And if you recall, an interaction means that the effect of one explanatory variable uh, is dependent on the value of another explanatory variable. So in the figure below, there's uh, two different processes. One uh, has main effects, so no interaction, and the other one has a very clear interaction. Um, you can interpret this as follows. If there's no interaction, then there is an intercept 0.3, so that's where this line crosses zero. Uh, and then there is a slope of x1, so that's uh, the x over here, uh, of 0 0.8. So for every unit increase in x1, we go up in y by 0 0.8. And then there's also an effect of x2, which in this case is a categorical variable of 0 0.7. So that means that uh, wherever you are, um, if you are uh, x2, then you are 0 0.7 higher. So this could, for example, be the difference between males and females. Uh, and if you're not male, then you have to be female. Uh, so then this uh, becomes zero, and then it's just 0 0.3 plus 0 0.8 times x. Now, in an interaction, it's different, because uh, in an interaction, you can't say that there is an overall effect of x1, right? Because what would the overall effect be? It's not this one, because that doesn't apply here. And it's not this one because that doesn't apply here. And it's also not the average because that doesn't apply to either of them. Um, so there is no overall effect of x1. And similarly, if you look at the difference between males and females, like where would you draw this arrow? Over here, the difference is different than over here. 
So uh, that means that depending on the value of uh, one of these variables, x1 or x2, the effect of the other variable is different. And that's what the interaction does. Now, the principle of marginality uh, states that if there is an interaction, there are no main effects and the other way around. So what that means is that uh, if the true process has an interaction between two variables, then there is no overall effect of x1 or of x2, only an effect of one given the other. Um, now, the uh, principle of marginality has some uh, important uh, implications. The first of which is that if there is an interaction in the population, then it is wrong not to include it in your model because uh, the model will answer a different question. Uh, another important implication is that if you include an interaction in a model, you must also include its constituent parts. So what that means is you cannot have an interaction effect without having the marginal effect of uh, x1 and x2. So here I've uh, shown four example models uh, in R. So the first one is just a model without interaction. The second one is a model with interaction. So we have x1, x2 and their combination. And uh, a different way to write this is to use a multiplication sign. So LM3 is exactly the same as LM2. Uh, but LM4 is incorrect because LM4 says uh, that Y is a function of the combination. And that violates the principle of marginality because that would be like saying uh, there is no X1, there's no X2, there's only uh, the interaction. And that doesn't mean anything. Uh, so that's an incorrect way of thinking about combinations. So. In summary, uh, if you believe there to be an interaction, then you have to include it uh, because it has a different interpretation than a model without interaction. Uh, and if you include an interaction, you must always include its constituent parts. All right, so that's one reason why you should include certain uh, variables in your model. Another reason is to avoid underfitting. So uh, underfitting, is simply when you have a model that oversimplifies the process. Uh, and when this happens, uh, yeah, the model explains too little variance in the outcome. So in other words, uh, it should have more explanatory variables or more combinations between them, uh, or it should in some way be more complex to reflect the uh, real biological process. Uh, and yet another way to describe that is that in the residuals of the model, there is still some uh, structure left of the systemic part of the process. So we still have some more to extract to have a good model. Uh, to give an example, uh, let's say that we have the iris data set and we want to model the uh, sepal length in millimeters. Now I've plotted the sepal length against the petal length and I'm showing here uh, two models, one which oversimplifies and one which doesn't. So this first model, just uh, uh, model sepal length as a function of species. So it says, all right, your sepal length is five. And if you're the other species, then it's five plus 0 0.9. And if you're the third species, then your sepal length is five plus 1.6 and then you're over here. But clearly uh, this is wrong because uh, yeah, there is an average sepal length for the species of uh, five plus 1.6, etc. Um, but depending on the petal length, there's clearly a difference in the sepal length. And the difference can be quite large. It can be larger than the differences between species. So a much better model is one that includes species and the petal length. And you can see that uh, the model much more closely resembles the trends that we observe in the data. So that's an example of underfitting. If you just know uh, which species an iris flower is, that's not enough information to uh, estimate the sepal length with a reasonable amount of precision. And then uh, if we add the petal length, uh, we, we get a model that has a much better fit. So here's another example. Uh, and this is an example why underfitting is not just a weak model, but it can be a completely wrong model. So here I've simulated some uh, quadratic data and I fitted a, uh, a line to it just by having a linear effect of X. And then on the right, I have a linear effect and a quadratic effect. And this is the correct way to do that in R. It mean, this means a polynomial of X of degree two. So that means uh, X and X squared. Um, 
Now, why is this model wrong? Well, in the beginning, it just slightly underestimates the trend in the data, but clearly after around 0 0.6, it's not just underestimating, it's in the completely wrong direction. So this model would have you believe that uh, as X increases, Y also increases, but this isn't true. This is only true for the first part of X1. But uh, yeah, if X1 is larger, like let's say 0 0.8 or 0 0.1, it is actually decreasing. So you can come to the completely wrong conclusion if you fit a model that's too simple. So in summary, uh, if you have a model that underfits, it's not just less precise, but it can be completely inaccurate. Uh, you can remedy underfitting simply by adding uh, explanatory variables which have a substantial effect until you have a good fit. And how you can tell whether there's a good fit or not is something that I'll explain at the end of the lecture. All right, so we've already had the principle of marginality, so whether you should include interactions or not, and uh, the uh, idea of underfitting, that your model oversimplifies. Uh, but there's one more very important reason uh, why you should include certain variables, and that is to avoid omitted variable bias and confounding. So omitted variable bias occurs when you fail to include a variable that has a substantial effect on the outcome. Uh, when you do this, it will bias the estimates of the remaining effects. So uh, in the example figure over here, this is a causal diagram. So uh, here, X has a positive influence on Y, O has a positive influence on Y, and O has a positive influence on X. Now, let's say that this is the true relationship in the population. And then here on the right, we see the relationship if we just regress Y on X. Um, what happens is that because uh, we don't see the effect of O, the model will attribute all of the difference to X. So you will largely overestimate um, the effect of X that it has on Y and come to the wrong conclusion. And you can imagine, let's say that instead of positive, this was negative, then uh, you, know, you can underestimate the effect of X on Y, or you could even completely mask it. So um, yeah, this means simply that uh, if you can, you should always include variables which you believe to have a substantial effect on the outcome. Um, so if you simply include both variables, then uh, the model will correctly attribute uh, part of it to O and part of it to X. So a special case of omitted variable bias is called confounding. And this is uh, the case when in the uh, actual relationship in the population, there isn't even an effect of X on Y, but there is some confounding variable C, uh, so C for confounder, uh, that has both a positive effect on X and a positive effect on Y. Now what happens if you don't include the confounder in your regression model is that you will incorrectly conclude a relationship between X on Y because the model sees, hmm, if X is larger, then Y is also larger. And that's true, but the reason is because of this confounder. Uh, so in this case, a completely non-existent relationship is revealed by your model if you fail to include the confounding variable. And uh, yeah, this might sound a little weird, but actually this happens quite a lot and uh, a lot of scientists fall prey to this. Uh, one famous example, which still happens from time to time, you can search on PubMed and uh, probably find uh, some uh, recent studies that uh, fall for this. Uh, is the supposed effect of coffee drinking on lung cancer development. So, you know, you drink coffee, you don't usually inhale it, so why would coffee have an effect specifically on lung cancer? Uh, well, the solution to this problem is quite simple. There's a confounder, namely smoking. And it just turns out that in most of these studies, there's a higher proportion of smokers among coffee drinkers than among people who don't drink coffee. So, in that case, smoking uh, is both associated with uh, coffee drinking and is associated with cancer development. And if you don't include smoking, then you will conclude that, um, and so if you don't include smoking, then you will conclude that uh, coffee drinking has a positive effect on uh, cancer development, positive meaning that the instance increases. So uh, yeah, that's one f uh, very famous example of confounding, uh, but there are many others. Uh, and I've, yeah, there, there are some over here that you can have a look at. Um, but yeah, just suffice to say that just like with omitted variable bias, uh, 
you can completely avoid the problem of confounding just by including any variables with a substantial effect on the outcome. Uh, I'm going to show this very quickly because uh, yeah, some of these examples are interesting. Uh, so yeah, another famous one is the obesity paradox, which is the idea that um, if you uh, have uh, a very serious disease, then it's better to be overweight, even though the entire uh, consensus among the scientific community is that being overweight is not good for your health. Um, and the reason for this is just an artifact of what BMI is. You know, BMI is a proxy for uh, your fat, uh, or at least that's what it's supposed to be, but it's really just a proxy for uh, your weight divided by um, your surface area. So that means that a bodybuilder can have the exact same BMI as an obese person, but these persons have a very different uh, health. So um, yeah, another interesting example is the idea that uh, if you live near power lines, uh, you have a higher chance of developing cancer. So let's all destroy the 5G towers and whatnot. But um, What's usually going on in these studies is that uh, what you're really seeing is the difference in uh, affluence. So uh, in a very rich neighborhood, you usually don't see many power lines uh, when you look out the window. Whereas um, if you live in a um, less affluent neighborhood, uh, then power lines are a lot more common, especially in uh, other countries. In the Netherlands, we don't have many power lines outside, but uh, let's say uh, Japan or America, uh, in a very rich neighborhood, there aren't power lines in the middle of the street, whereas in a uh, poorer neighborhood, you'll see them everywhere. So what's really happening is it's not the distance to a power line uh, that causes you to have cancer, but it's that uh, poverty is both associated with uh, the presence of power lines in your neighborhood and uh, yeah, worse dietary habits uh, or worse access to a healthy food, uh, worse access to uh, medical care. Um, yeah, and all the other things associated with poverty that might increase your chance of developing cancer. So the confounding variable here is uh, poverty. And uh, it's not power lines themselves that cause cancer. As I mentioned before, uh, this can be easily avoided just by including uh, the uh, variables which might have a substantial effect on the outcome. So if you include a confounder in your model, it no longer confounds uh, the variable of interest. All right, so uh, we just covered three reasons why you should include certain variables, but there are also reasons why you should not include certain variables. And uh, those I'm gonna be discussing now. The first reason uh, why you cannot and should not include certain variables uh, in your model is collinearity. Uh, sometimes it's called multicollinearity and some people spell with two L's or one L. Um, but collinearity uh, or multicollinearity means that when an explanatory variable can be described as a linear function of other, other explanatory variables, uh, then the set of those uh, variables is uh, collinear. And if this relationship is exact, then uh, it is perfectly collinear. So what that means is that if there is a redundancy in the information uh, that the explanatory variables have on the outcome, then it is impossible for the model to uh, estimate the unique effects of each variable. So uh, as a simple example, consider uh, two people pushing two rocks or two people pushing one rock. Uh, if the two people are each pushing a different rock of the same weight, uh, then you can quantify the difference with which they're pushing the rock, right? If they're pushing it up a hill uh, and whoever is faster is pushing harder. But if both people uh, are pushing the same rock at the same time and it's moving in a straight uh, uh, line up the hill, then it's impossible to quantify the difference uh, with which both persons are pushing. So yeah, when this happens in your model, so you're adding two variables, for example, in this case, the two people pushing, uh, uh, then um, yeah, it will result in unstable estimates, uh, which means that if you remove a data point uh, from your uh, uh, model, then the entire um, uh, coefficients of your model can change. So uh, signs can flip and a 10 can become a one. So that's what unstable means. Uh, it can also inflate your standard errors, which means that uh, nothing will be significant, uh, or it can even result in failure to estimate coefficients at all and return an error, which is particularly the case when you have perfect collinearity. Uh, 
Now, the stronger the redundancy among your explanatory variables, the more problematic collinearity is. So let me give you some examples. Uh, first, let's say that you want to know the effect of body composition on blood pressure, right? So you measure blood pressure and you measure some variables related to your body composition. So uh, yeah, you might argue that uh, there's a difference between uh, heavier and uh, lighter individuals. So you include body weight, uh, then, uh, well, one part of your body composition is your fat free mass. Uh, and of course, you want to measure someone's body fat. But uh, oops, there we run into a problem, because if we add fat free mass to body fat, then that's the same as your body weight. So if you try to include all three of these variables, then uh, they don't contain unique information. If you include fat free mass and body fat, then the model already knows your body weight. And if you include body weight and body fat, then you know, the difference is already implicitly in the model. So uh, if you include all three, that results in perfect collinearity, uh, which means uh, very bad. <laughs> so the solution would be to remove one of the variables that cause collinearity. Now in this example, um, it doesn't matter which one you remove. Usually you would want to remove the one with the least interesting uh, new information, or you remove the one uh, which is uh, most strongly collinear to the rest or you remove uh, the variable that is the most difficult to measure, which is particularly something you'll do in clinical science because certain blood tests uh, are less reliable than other ones. So if they're collinear with other variables, then of course you're gonna remove the uh, uh, less reliable tests first. But in this example, you could technically remove any of the three variables to solve the issue. All right, um, I don't know why this equation is showing here, but um, yeah, we can already conclude that uh, one of the variables should not be uh, in the model. And uh, my browser has made a spoiler here. Uh, but yeah, we had the four variables over here, uh, sorry, four models over here. Uh, the first one just has an effect of weight on blood pressure. Second one, weight and height. The third one, weight, height and interaction. And the fourth one has weight, height and BMI. But uh, BMI is going to probably cause problems because uh, BMI is just your weight divided by your surface area. And surface area is just uh, measured as your height squared. So weight and height are already in a model. So including BMI is going to add very little new information uh, when height and weight are already included. So um, yeah, in this case, uh, I would not include BMI. You can try an interaction because that, uh, uh, because of the principle of marginality, including this interaction will only add one more effect. Um, and it accounts for the difference when there's already accounted for weight and height. So that is the correct way to do it. And BMI would be the wrong way to do it. Okay, so if you're not sure whether there is problematic collinearity, then uh, you can calculate the condition number of the design matrix. Now, the design matrix is the uh, intercept. So it's a matrix of all the variables that you have. So intercepts just one, 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 one for every row and all the fixed effects. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're not familiar with this, uh, that's okay because we don't cover linear algebra in this course. Uh, so you don't have to know what this means. Uh, but just for uh, the sake of completion, I will also uh, briefly explain what this is. So <clears throat> if you have your design matrix and you perform uh, eigen decomposition, uh, then you can simply sort the eigenvalues from large to small. And then uh, the uh, condition number of your design matrix is simply the ratio of uh, its largest to smallest eigenvalue. Uh, and again, you don't have to know this to pass the course. It's just I, I wanted to include it. Okay, so um, how can we work with it? Uh, as a rule of thumb, if a matrix has a condition number of 30 or less, then we say that it is well conditioned. So that means there's no problematic collinearity. Um, and you might not know how to do eigen decomposition, uh, but there's a package that can do it uh, very easily for you uh, called MC test. And it works very simple. Uh, you install the package and then you load it and then you just do MC test model. Um, so here I have an example model, uh, which is a linear model uh, using the iris data set. And I say the sepal length is a function of uh, the sepal width, the petal length, the petal width and the species. Now uh, you can probably imagine that the length of the sepals, it might be related to these variables, but if we include all of these variables, uh, the width of the sepals, uh, the length of the petals, and the width of the petals, 
at some point there isn't much unique information added anymore unless there is flower there are flowers with very different shapes but we also have a variable for species so um, there is not much unique information in each of these variables and that is reflected by the condition number because if we look over here uh, it gives the uh, multicollinearity diagnostics with several different tests, uh, which in my opinion you can all ignore. Uh, and then if you look at the condition number, you can see that it is well above 30. And the test has also said that uh, yes, there is collinearity according to the condition number. So that means that you have to remove a variable. And the way to proceed here would be to remove uh, one variable, uh, anyone, and then look at the condition number again. And then uh, go back and remove another variable and look at the condition number. And uh, you'll want to remove the variable that uh, yields the biggest decrease in condition number, uh, because then uh, with only one removal, uh, you have solved the collinearity issue. And you know if there's still collinearity after that, then you're gonna have to remove another one. All right, so in summary, if there is collinearity, or in other words, uh, redundancy among your uh, variables, then uh, remove the offending explanatory variable unless there is no more problematic collinearity. And if you're not sure what is causing the collinearity, uh, use the MC test package. And as is always the case in statistics, if you already have a reason to believe that a variable will cause collinearity issues, or in other words, add very little unique information, then there's no need to run a test and you don't need the MC test package. Um, so in exam for example, in the uh, BMI example, um, yeah, we already know that BMI is not going to add little information by the definition of BMI uh, because it already includes weight and height. So yeah, uh, you don't need to run a test to conclude that you can omit BMI. Uh, and if you do run a test, you're just uh, opening the door for additional false positives because every single test that you do has its own chance of producing a false positive so I would avoid using tests for diagnostics. Just look at uh, the condition number and um, yeah, for other things, you can look at the diagnostic plots. All right, so that's one important reason not to include too much uh, uh, different variables, uh, too many variables, because uh, they can become collinear. Uh, the next reason is mediation. So, if the interest lies in an indirect effect, then it might be mediated by another variable. So in this example, uh, we are interested in the uh, effect of X on Y, but actually X doesn't directly influence Y, but is mediated by some variable M. Now, if you're interested in the causal path, then of course this is the model that you're interested in. But if you're interested in the indirect effect of X on Y, uh, which I'll give an example of in the next slide, then uh, you shouldn't include M because it will mask the effect and it will say, nope, there's no relationship between X and Y. So uh, if this is the case, you should not include the mediating variable because it will mask the effect of interest. So in other words, uh, including a variable that uh, opens up a causal path for another variable can mask an effect of interest. Now, why is that a problem? Uh, suppose that you want to estimate the extent to which fossil fuel consumption contributes to global warming. Uh, the problem is that uh, fossil fuel consumption does not directly influence the global temperature, right? What probably happens is that uh, you consume fossil fuels and that releases uh, greenhouse gases and those contribute to global warming. So you might be tempted to include uh, carbon dioxide levels as these are very strongly related to global temperature and I just told you to include everything that has a large effect. But if you're interested in the effect that fossil fuel consumption indirectly has on the global temperature, then you shouldn't include carbon dioxide because if you do, then the model will see that, oh yeah, uh, fossil fuel is, uh, consumption increases CO2, increases global temperature. There is no effect of fossil fuel consumption on global temperature. And then you would incorrectly conclude that the contribution of fossil fuel consumption to global temperature is none, even though it's there. So uh, in short, if you're interested in an indirect effect, like the one, exam uh, the one explained in this example, then uh, you should not include any potential mediators. All right, so in summary, mediators don't belong in a regression model 
unless of course the interest lies in the mediating effect uh, and, and no that's not something that happens very often uh, in biology but it's possible uh, if that's the case what you need is called mediation analysis uh, but that's beyond the scope of this lecture and also b beyond the scope of this course but uh, yeah if you're uh, seeing this again for your uh, internship or something and you think you need this uh, don't hesitate to let us know all right so We've already had collinearity. If there's too much redundancy, uh, your model will fail to estimate things uh, uh, uniquely. If there's mediation, you can mask the effects that you're actually in interested in. And lastly, if you include too many variables, it will result in overfitting. Now, uh, we already discussed underfitting, and overfitting is just the opposite. So underfitting is oversimplifying the process, and overfitting is over uh, complexifying the process. Uh, so in other words, if you add too many parameters to a model, which could be too many uh, explanatory variables or too many interactions between them, then the model will start overfitting. Uh, and this is easy to demonstrate with polynomial regression. So polynomial regression is not really uh, something that we use very often uh, because it's very unstable. If you do think you need it, you should look up the word spline. Um, but it serves uh, the purpose of showing uh, what will happen very well. Um, because let's have a look here. I simulated quadratic data, and if I fit just the line, well, then we have an underfit because it's clearly not following the trend well. Uh, and I simulated this data as quadratic, so this line is uh, as good as it gets. Uh, but we can make the line much more complicated. We can add a cubic effect and a fourth degree polynomial, fifth degree, and uh, well, I uh, added it all the way to a 15th degree polynomial. And what you see happens is that. Uh, the line twists and contorts as much as possible to fit every observation as closely as possible. But this, of course, isn't picking up the trend that is uh, uh, present in the population, but it's overfitting the sample. It's picking up the residuals, it's picking up the error in the process, and it's mistaking it for the systemic part. So, for example, over here, uh, yeah, it, it twists like this and goes all the way down where there isn't even any data just because it can then fit these three points very closely. So in terms of goodness of fit, this model is amazing. It fits uh, the sample extremely well. But in terms of generalizing to the population, I think it's very unlikely that uh, the population suddenly makes this dip and then goes back, even though we have no data to support this claim. There's nothing over here. Um, and of course, I know that it's wrong because I simulated this data to be quadratic. So it should look like this. So that's uh, called overfitting. And this is a bit of a, yeah, a silly example with a 15 degree polynomial, which is something you should never do. Um, but the same will happen when it's much less obvious if you have a lot of potential confounders and um, you're worried about emitted variable bias and uh, there are some interaction that is uh, very large, but you think that uh, it might be uh, affecting the outcome. So you might have good reasons to include a lot of variables but if you don't have enough samples, it will start overfitting. And, you know, you can't plot 15 different variables very easily, which is why I plot one variable in 15 different ways uh, over here. Uh, but even if you can't plot it, the model can be overfitting. So um, the goal is then to strike a balance. We don't want to overfit, so we don't want too many parameters. And we also don't want to underfit, so we don't want too little parameters. So if we underfit, then we don't explain any of the variance in the outcome. Uh, and on the other extreme, if we overfit, then we are picking up on the error and um, we are following ex every single peculiarity of this particular sample that actually has nothing to do with the overall trend in the population. Um, so if the model is too simple, um, you will underfit. And if the model is too complex, you will overfit. And now we're going to talk about how you can strike this balance. Uh, yeah, so first, uh, why is it bad that you fit the sample well? Um, and that's because, you know, we're not interested in the sample. We're almost never interested in the sample. Uh, we're actually interested in the population that the sample comes from. Uh, and the sample is just a reflection of that population. Now, uh, I've added a reference here because, um, uh, yeah, the population, when we talk about statistics, uh, has a slightly different meaning than population when you talk about biology.
So if you're not 100% sure what I mean, then uh, you can read this again. Um, yeah, the, an optimal model is then one that generalizes well to the population, so it should neither underfit uh, nor overfit. All right, so one way to strike this balance is by following what is called Occam's razor, and it's also called the law of parsimony. Uh, I don't really like this name because it's not a law. Uh, it's not something that's been proven or something or uh, something that everyone believes. Um, so I just call it Occam's razor. Um, it's a heuristic guide for selecting the optimal model. Now, if you don't know what the word heuristic means, it means that it is a um, tool that uh, appears to work well, uh, but we have no mathematical proof for why it works well, and it's not something that everyone accepts. So um, I will come back to that later. But what Occam's razor says is that if two models explain the outcome equally well, then the simplest model is the correct one. And this is often loosely interpreted as uh, a model should explain significantly more variance in the outcome to justify an increase in model complexity. So in other words, uh, you should only include a variable if it really contributes to the fit. Now, uh, Occam's razor is not a fact. Uh, it hasn't been proven to be true. And uh, you, yeah, you can easily produce a counterexample to Occam's razor. Uh, but let's say that a doctor can choose among 20 different blood tests uh, but he doesn't have time to do all of them, and time is of the essence, then uh, it would be nice to have a parsimonious model, a model chosen by Occam's razor, because we want the smallest model that still explains a lot of the variance. So, um, yeah, parsimony is not always a goal, and you shouldn't always follow Occam's razor, but uh, depending on what you're using the model for, uh, it can be very useful. And sometimes parsimony is something you really want, like in this example. And in that case, Occam's razor can help decide. Uh, yeah, again, it's worth noting that not everyone agrees with this notion. It's not something that's been proven. And uh, for example, Frank Harrell, which is a uh, famous contemporary statistician, has said that uh, parsimony is your enemy. Nature does not act parsimoniously and data sets do not have enough information to allow one to choose the right variables. And yeah, he definitely has a point, um, but uh, yeah, it's a little bit too technical to explain that now, but uh, I think the key message here is that you shouldn't follow parsimony blindly. It is not a substitute for all the other things that I just discussed. Uh, and it can only be useful to uh, select among a small number of uh, models if you know that parsimony is useful in the context of your research. Um, but yeah, say for example that you have a large number of variables to choose from, so more than 10, uh, and yeah, 10 is actually a lot because you can also have interactions between 10 variables and you can have all kinds of combinations of uh, 9 variables or 8 or 7 or 6 or 5. So um, yeah, if you cannot decide uh, uh, based on what has been discussed so far, then rather than just removing them one by one, it is much better to include them all and use regularization, which is something that we'll discuss in a later lecture. Okay, so um, with uh, yeah, uh, Occam's razor uh, explained, uh, the last section will go over some methods that you can use to choose between a limited number of candidate models. So some of these models uh, pursue parsimony, uh, others just maximize the variance explained, or the likelihood, which is the chance that your model uh, could produce your sample, uh, and yet other methods uh, optimize predictive performance. So none of these measures is necessarily better than the other, uh, and they can all come to different conclusions because they have different objectives. So you should always uh, first consider what you're using your model for, and therefore which of these is uh, more relevant and what you should be optimizing. And then you can choose the right measure. So the first is the likelihood ratio test. And uh, this is a test for selecting the best model among two nested models. So uh, nested means that uh, the variables of one model are all in the var variables of another model. So in the example over here, I have two models. And you can see that uh, the variables in the first model are all present in the variable of the second model. Uh, sorry, in the, yeah, in the variables of the second model. Um, okay, so it works uh, by performing a test whether uh, model one is more likely to have produced the sample that we have than model two. Uh, 
And if that's the case, and if that's significantly the case, uh, then we say that uh, model two is more likely than model one or the other way around. So um, yeah, in this example, uh, it's an exception actually, because uh, if you have normally distributed errors, which is the case for normal uh, linear models, then you don't need a likely ratio test. It just does an F test, which is simpler. Uh, so what it does, uh, this is how you use the test. Please ignore the name. It has nothing to do with ANOVA, which uh, annoys everyone that has to explain this. Uh, but yeah, this is just the name of the function. Um, and we put in two different models, one with only the effect of pedal length and one of the effect of pedal length and species. And then when we run this function, compare model one to, com to model two, then we see that they have a different uh, number of degrees of freedom. There are 150 observations in the IRIS data set. And this one only used uh, two different uh, uh, degrees of freedom, one for the intercept, one for the slope. And this one uses uh, four degrees of freedom. So one for the intercept, one for the slope of pedal length, and two for the other two species that aren't in the intercept. So that brings us to 146. So this is a more complex model because it has fewer degrees of freedom left, uh, but it also has a lower residual sum of squares, RSS. So that means that it fits the sample better. Uh, well, the, these two residual sum of squares are then compared. So that means how much variance is left in the residuals. Uh, and uh, this variance is compared with an F-test, which is what F-tests are for. Um, and we see that uh, apparently it's significant. So you could use this as an argument to include the variable species on the basis that it significantly uh, explains more variance uh, than uh, the other variable. Uh, sorry, than the other model. All right, so another measure is adjusted R-squared. And uh, this is actually just R squared. So R squared is the variance explained, uh, and it adds a penalty for model complexity. Now, uh, this is what the penalty looks like. You don't have to memorize this, but it's just to show you that um, if there is um, uh, more model complexity, so more parameters in the model, then the R squared will be penalized more heavily because this is in the denominator. So given two candidate models, uh, the R squared adjusted answers the question, which of these models explains more variance in the outcome with respect to their model complexity? Um, yeah, a quick side note, R squared adjusted is only appropriate for linear uh, more models, sorry, normal linear models and not for GLMs uh, because it optimizes variance explained. And a GLM, if you have a Poisson distribution or binomial or exponential or Tweety or whatever, um, then, the measure that you're optimizing isn't variance. You know, variance is the spread of the normal distribution. But if you have an asymmetric distribution, then we're not interested in variance. So instead, a GLM explains dispersion, which is like the generalized version of variance. So you can select a model that explains more variance, but that doesn't have to coincide with a better GLM, so more dispersion explained. So don't use this for GLMs. Um, yeah, R squared adjusted is uh, included by default in the summary of a linear model, uh, which I'll show in the next slide. So here I have the, the same two models that I showed in the uh, previous section. So one with an effect for pedal length and one with an effect for pedal length and species. And uh, then we can see if we look at the uh, multiple R squared and the adjusted R squared. So multiple R squared just means R squared. Um, we can see that uh, this model explains uh, seventy-six percent of the variance in sample length, uh, and we can also see if we correct for the variables included. In this case, just one. Then it's this number. What this number is exactly doesn't matter because it doesn't have a meaning. But we can compare it to another model. So um, the reason this matters is because um, if you include more variables in your model, they will always explain more variance. So R squared always goes up. But adjusted R squared penalizes for the number of parameters. So adjusted R squared only goes up if the increase in model complexity is justified by an increase in variance explained. So the first model explains 76% uh, of the variance in the sample length. The second model, if I do this summary, I just uh, use this so that I don't have to print the entire thing on the screen. Um, I can see how much variance the second model explains, which is 83%. So of course, 83 is more than 76, but what we're really interested in is if we correct for the model complexity, 
does the second model still produce a better fit? And the answer is yes, it still produces a better fit. So that means that uh, with respect to uh, variance explained in the outcome, including species in the model is a good uh, thing to do. So uh, just to make it uh, very clear, adjusted R squared is for comparing models and multiple R squared is the actual variance explained. All right, the next measure is called Akaiki's information criterion. Um, so this is the negative log likelihood and uh, lower AIC is better and it's penalized for the number of variables. So yeah, this is what it looks like. You don't have to memorize this, uh, but I'll just show it so you can compare it to uh, BIC, which is another measure. Uh, but yeah, suffice to say that likelihood is a measure of goodness of fit. So likelihood is the chance that your model would have produced this data. Um, now, if likelihood is uh, maximum, at its maximum, then uh, the model uh, is uh, at its optimum. So that means that if the uh, negative log likelihood is very low, then uh, that means that the model is very good because negative something uh, that you want to maximize is the same as minimizing, uh, which is something that uh, in uh, statistics we do a lot because computers are better at minimizing things than maximizing things. Um, okay, so we add 2p, so that means that if your model is more complex, the AIC will uh, become bigger. Uh, for every parameter, it becomes uh, bigger by uh, 2. Um, and that means that uh, uh, a model is only better if its uh, likelihood has increased so much that it justifies the increase in complexity. So it has a similar objective to R squared adjusted, namely to uh, maximize the fit while respecting the model complexity. Uh, the difference is that uh, this penalty is a bit more strict than R squared adjusted. So AIC uh, favors parsimony. It favors models that are as small as possible while still explaining a lot of the uh, uh, outcome. Uh, in R, it's very simple. You can just say AIC model and that will return the AIC value of the model. Um, but just like with R squared adjusted, uh, the value itself has no meaning, uh, so it doesn't matter if it's 100 or minus 30 or whatever, it could be zero, uh, but you can compare it between models, and then the lowest value is the best. A very similar measure is the Bayesian information criterion, which is the negative log likelihood, uh, penalized not only for the variables, but also for the sample size. And uh, yeah, this is only appropriate if uh, the sample size is a lot bigger than uh, the number of parameters in the model, uh, but it is an, um, even more strict for model complexity, this, uh, uh, this equation, and also it respects the sample size. So if your sample is very large, it'll allow a slightly larger model. Um, but what this does is that it favors parsimonious models. So if the goal of your research is to have a small model to explain uh, the process, then BIC is a nice measure, provided that you have a large enough sample size. This just means N much bigger than P. So just like AIC, uh, you can just type BIC model. So for example, with an LM object or an ANOVA object or GLM or whatever, and then you'll get the BIC of the model. Now, uh, BIC doesn't really have a meaning, just like AIC, uh, but if you compare different models, then the model with the lowest BIC is the best model. All right, finally, uh, we have a completely different uh, uh, measure called the Predicted Residual Error Sum of Squares, or PRESS. And if you use a model for prediction, then none of what I just discussed is particularly relevant, because uh, if you uh, do prediction, then what you care about is how well your model predicts, not how much of the outcome it explains or how realistic it is. None of that matters. It just has to predict. So uh, the press statistic minimizes the estimated out of sample error. Um, but yeah, that's kind of weird because uh, we only have our sample. So how can you estimate the out of sample performance using our own sample? And the answer is cross validation. And it works by uh, training a model on a subset of uh, the data, so on a subset of your sample, and then assessing its performance on the remainder of the sample. And uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, something that's very important and used a lot in statistics. So there will be a separate lecture on cross-validation. 
uh, but I'll give you uh, the basic idea in the picture. Um, so yeah, uh, the press statistic looks like this. And what it does is it uses leave one out cross validation. So that uh, just means that it cross validates uh, with one observation at a time. So every time we remove one observation, so this is the first run of press, um, and we remove observation number one, and then we fit the model on all the remaining observations and we predict the value of this last observation. Then we compare it to the real value uh, that we didn't use to train it. Uh, and that gives us an idea of how well this model predicts. Um, yeah, and then we do it again, but now uh, we leave the first observation in and we take the second observation out. And uh, then we fit the data on observation one, three, four, blah, 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 all the way until the end. And then um, we predict what the value of the second observation would have been. And we compare it to the real value of the second observation. Now, you do this n times. So you do it once for every uh, sample. And uh, that gives you a sum of squared errors from what the real uh, uh, pr uh, value should have been. And uh, this is actually a really good way to get an idea of how well your model would perform on new data. Um, so yeah, just, just in short, blue is train the model, red is test the model, and we do it once for every observation. We train the whole model again. So you train the same model, um, yeah, n times, and then you average that to, uh, sorry, you sum it uh, to get an idea of uh, which model is better at uh, predicting. So uh, you can write a for loop that does this. All you have to do is just leave one observation out, uh, run the model that you always would on uh, all observations minus one. Uh, and then uh, in the next part of the for loop, do the same on the second observation, etc. Uh, but yeah, there's already a package that, uh, that uh, has written an implementation that works really well uh, in uh, package qpcr. So if you install this package and then do library, you can simply do press and then model. And if you just want to see the press statistic and not all the other outputs, uh, then this is uh, the only thing you need. Uh, of course, this is computationally expensive because instead of running the model once, we're running it a lot of times. So if you have a large data set, like say 10,000 observations, then <laughs> uh, your model will be fitted 10,000 times. So uh, especially for more complex models, like a mixed model or a generalized linear mixed model, uh, this can take a very long time. So for large data sets, uh, we usually don't use leave one out cross validation, uh, especially like for neural networks, it would be insane. It, it could take uh, days or weeks to run. So instead you would usually use something like 10 fold cross validation, where instead of splitting data n times, uh, we split the data 10 uh, different times into 10 different parts. Okay, so uh, just like most of the values I just mentioned, Press has no real interesting meaning on its own uh, that you should try to interpret, but it's just for comparing the press value of one model to the press value of another model. Now, since it's the uh, sum of uh, differences from what it should be, lower is better. All right, so uh, let's make a small conclusion here. Uh, how do we determine what the best model is? So yeah, we're studying some biological process and uh, yeah, in the beginning I said, we want a model that uh, resembles a systemic part as closely as possible. But of course, that's only really true if you're using your model for inference and not for prediction. Um, so in prediction, we just want to make as little mistakes as possible on predicting the biological process. But uh, yeah, in the example that I gave with the uh, power lines, you know, we don't care if power lines cause cancer. If it adds uh, to the uh, predictive performance, just include it in a model. Uh, so it's very different than what we usually do uh, in small biological research where we're trying to do inference. Uh, and in inference, we want to understand the systematic part. Uh, so if you're trying to quantify the effect of interest, then model selection uh, can actually be really helpful. Uh, but yeah, another caveat, in uh, hypothesis testing, you should be very careful with model selection or don't do it at all. Because every model that you compare uh, is another chance that you're going to make false positives, especially if you select your model based on significance. So you can correct for this uh, by doing some multiple testing correction for the number of models evaluated, but yeah, that's going to drain power and lead to more false negatives. 
So generally speaking, I wouldn't use it for hypothesis testing. So um, finally then, which measure should you use to determine what model uh, you're going to evaluate? I think the first consideration should always be the interactions, uh, the confounders that you think might be there, uh, potential mediators and uh, potential presence of collinearity. And only after you've made those considerations can you use one or several of the following to help you guide uh, through the process. So uh, you can use a likelihood ratio test to see if one model fits significantly better than the other. Uh, you can use R squared adjusted to compare the variance explained by the models. Uh, but yet again, this is only appropriate for normal linear models. You can use AIC to obtain a parsimonious model or BIC to obtain, obtain an even more parsimonious model, provided that N is large enough. Uh, or you can use the press statistic to obtain uh, the better predictive model. Now, um, yeah, again, if, if you use the model a little bit for prediction and a little bit for inference, you should follow the entire uh, uh, order of uh, considerations. But if you're only using the model for prediction, then uh, yeah, we don't care about any of this. We don't care about interaction, confounders, mediators, uh, collinearity, um, or even goodness of fit. We just want to know how well it predicts. So yeah, prediction is a, a bit of a different uh, thing. All right, some final thoughts then. If you can't decide between two models, I wouldn't spend too much time to try and decide. I would just include them both. Uh, especially if they come to more or less the same conclusion, uh, you're only having a more strong conclusion by showing that uh, your conclusion is invariant to the choice of model. And this is particularly common in clinical science where often uh, the clinicians have to decide whether or not they include certain variables that may or may not confound. So uh, yeah, often uh, there's a lot of debate, oh, should you include sex, should you include age in a model? Uh, but yeah, what a lot of uh, studies do is just run one model with, one model without, and if they, if they come to the same conclusion, well, great, then uh, you've shown that irrespective of uh, the variables you add to the model, you come to the same conclusion. And that's really what statistics is about, not your p-values or whatever, but the conclusions that you can draw about your data. So um, yeah, another note, if you want to report p-values of the final model, then you should really avoid using model selection. Because if you select a model on the basis of having a better fit, uh, you will get lower p-values, so it's, it's biased. And the chance of a false positive will actually be a lot higher than the p-value suggests. Um, and usually when you consider a model for the purpose of hypothesis testing, uh, you should include all variables that you're interested in. And um, this model is then already the answer to which variables are significant, because they're all in there and they will all have a p-value. And if you remove insignificant p-values, uh, that's just going to bias the other ones. So that's not something that I recommend, at least not when you're doing hypothesis testing. That concludes everything for this lecture. And um, yeah, I will also be giving this live. So if you're watching this as a video and still want to ask some questions, don't hesitate to join the Cultura environment. Thank you for listening.